welcome back. We're, back. we're on to our second topic, which is, um, or our first main topic, which is air pollution. So a quick recap. Think about whether you remember what ecology is. What is end of pipe technology as opposed to any other type of technology? Uh, what happened with the increase in population on the earth and what does that do? How does that make it more or less important that we do something about the environment? And anthropogenic, give some examples of anthropogenic environmental disasters that means caused by man, anthros is man. What's the main reason for the development of environmental protection or movements to do movements to do that? Okay, so let's go on to the atmosphere. I won't just answer the questions, that would be silly. So the air, the, air, the atmosphere is what we have above us. There's a picture of, uh, so that's the moon and this is our planet and this bit that's fading out is light scattering of particles in the atmosphere at MOS from vapour. So it's, yeah, those are not spectacularly useful things, but it's obviously quite heavy. And uh, we're talking about 500 kilometers, although the density goes down and down as you go up. And so when we get up to the top, the, there aren't very many molecules there at all. Sorry, I keep looking in the wrong direction. Okay, I'm not gonna go over this much because this is just the Greek terms for the different spheres. So the biosphere, the hydrosphere for water, the lithosphere for lithos, for stone, cryosphere is where we live, and the atmosphere. So we need the atmosphere to live on planets where there is no atmosphere, there isn't really any life so far that we've discovered. Um, water would dry up and all kinds of problems would arise. Um, okay, so the rain, yeah, okay, the local composition of the atmosphere affects the rain, uh, it inf influences the weathering of rocks, well that's kind of obvious I guess, so wind will weather the rocks and rain does that too, um, and yeah okay, support the expansion, support the transport of sound. So we won't look at this right now for this, um, this is just the electromagnetic spectrum, I don't know why it's in this particular section. Uh, it's not for sound, it's for light. Uh, we can see um, so cosmic rays and x-rays up here and long wavelength things like radios down at the bottom and visible in the middle. We will come back to that later probably if we need it. So let's look at air pollution in the atmosphere. So uh, they've got some terms here, trophosphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. Those are going up from the bottom. Um, it would be hard to remember those from these terms. So let's have a look at a picture. So this is a picture with temperature. Um, yeah, no, yes, temperature. And obviously the pressure goes down as we go up. There isn't a high pressure in a low pressure region. So this is altitude and pressure and they both go up. But note that the altitude goes up linearly and the pressure does not. It goes up in a log scale. So it goes down and down from one atmosphere down to pretty much zero. But it's going log so it goes down very fast to start with and then it goes down slower and slower because it's the weight of the atmosphere that's causing the pressure. But we can see the temperature down here, there's a comparatively high pressure. That's because the ground is absorbing light from the sun and converting it into heat. Then it goes down and down and down until it gets to here. It starts to come back up again, and that's because there is a, um, parts of the atmosphere are absorbing light. So this is the, uh, we'll see what that's absorbing, but it's mostly um, ultraviolet that's being absorbed there, it's being converted into heat and so it's mostly dumped here, uh, the heat. So it causes this bit to be hotter, then it cools back down again and it heats back up again. And down here it's much the same, it, the temperature drops and drops and drops. And then when we get out into very, very low 
pressure, the, um, the concept of temperature breaks down because we don't have a, a, a gas which has got a pressure. You can see the pressure is 0 0.001 millibar. So uh, one, two, yeah, a thousand, so a millionth, yeah, a millionth of uh, atmosphere of pressure. And that means that the particles spend a very long time, the molecules spend a very long time before they hit something else. And that means that the concept of temperature is not really very easy to define. And so it's more the uh, orbital speed. So if we, if we hit a particle, it behaves as if it's very hot because it hasn't hit anything. It keeps absorbing and absorbing and absorbing light from the sun, getting more and more excited. And it never really interacts with anything. So there are free electrons and ions up there because they don't interact very often. So that's our temperature profile and it defines these terms, which is why I find it easier to speak about it here. So the troposphere, which is where we mostly live, the first 10 kilometers ish, so it's seven to 17, they say, depending on the local conditions is where the temperature drops. And then it goes back up again to the stratosphere. The stratopause is the warmest place. And it goes back down again. And then it comes back up again as we go to such a low pressure that the temperature meaning goes weird. So here's a picture of an uh, airliner flying in the bottom of the troposphere, the, or the top of the troposphere, the bottom of the stratosphere, that's about where they fly. Um, then um, out, we can see that's the ozone layer, it's in a bit smaller, sorry it's behind my head. It says ozone layer here, here where my mouse is, it says ozone layer. And then as we get further out, we get um, more damaged molecules, so little bits of molecules because the pressure's going down. So they are in more reactive states because they don't interact with, very, with much for a long time. Down here, they're bump, bumping into things, jostling the whole time, and so they can't form these reactive chemicals. So this is, oh, that's meteors, okay. Um, what else we got? We've got rocket planes up in the thermosphere and satellites just in the top of the atmosphere. Remember the concentration of molecules goes down logarithmically and so there's still some out there and they are behaving as if they're very hot so they hit the satellites and they tend to erode them quite strongly. And they're mostly things that are quite light so they're hydrogen and oxygen, ions, and atoms. And so uh, Aurora is up in here in the thermosphere. Yep. Here's a better picture of one. I haven't seen one, so I don't know what they really look like. I don't think that your, one's experience is quite like that. Okay, so this is the bottom where most of our weather happens, where most of the things happen that affect us directly. And uh, there's a relatively sort of constant drop in temperature per uh, unit height. Um, and the air density goes down. Okay. In the atmosphere, normally, it's mostly nitrogen, as we know, 78%. Then we've got oxygen, which is what we breathe. Uh, then there's a small amount of water and argon. And then all of this tiny bit is spread out up here. So all of this is the tiny bit, which is mostly carbon dioxide. It was uh, lower than this, but it's gone up. Then there are other noble gases, neon and helium. Here's methane. Then we've got hydrogen, nitric, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, ozone. And then we've got an even more tiny amounts. So that's PP parts per million, the one in a million particles, this is parts per billion, one in a billion particles, and this is parts per trillion, so one uh, molecule in a trillion molecules. There aren't very many, but they're still important. So this is uh, methanol, uh, no, this is methanoic acid, this is hydrogen peroxide, this is ethane, um, ammonia, this is, um, I don't know, this is uh, a chlorine, whoops, HCHO, oh, it's 
formaldehyde, um, nitric acid, sulfuric acid or sulfur dioxide, other nitrous oxides, and then there's a grave zone for everything else. So it keeps going and going and going. There are small amounts of all kinds of things in there, uh, but very small amounts. It's mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but the small amounts of things affect us. So what are we going on about here? This is air pressure. Okay, Do air pressure depends on the function of height and the temperature slightly. It depends on the, um, uh, that's about it. Don't know why, what else they're saying. Function of time and place, okay, so weather. Talking about the other possibility we can have water vapor in the air and we usually measure the either the absolute humidity the amount of water in the air per cubic meter or per liter the amount depending on when it's going to rain so the saturation point the relative humidity to 100 percent 100 percent is all it can hold at low temperature 100 percent is not is quite low absolute humidity which is why when it gets cold outside water tends to drop out of the air. It's all ve fairly uh, simple, but that's how it works. Oh, somebody's calling me. So what have we got here? This is the temperature and relative humidity or amount. So if we take, oops, let me stop and have a quick look. Okay, I worked out what this graph is off. So these this is not a scale, that's what was confusing me. So if we take uh, this one, which is the 20% line, at 30 degrees centigrade, at the there will be seven grams per cubic meter of water in the air at 100% uh, relative humidity. So if it's completely saturated, we get about 32, 33 grams per cubic meter. And if we cool it down to, let's say, uh, 10, let's have 10 because it's close to a line, it's only 10 grams per cubic meter, so we can get three times as much in by increasing the temperature by 20 degrees. Um, if we take it, so if we take the, our air that's at 100% humidity at 10 degrees and we just heat it up to 30 degrees, we go down to 25%, 30% relative humidity. That's uh, how relative humidity works. So the, the, the blue curves or the curves are how much water we can get in the air. And each of these are for different relative humidities. Oops, hard to change. So what else do we find in the air? Well, we've got biological stuff. So that's a current theme. Bacteria, fungal spores, but viruses are what are the current theme with our pandemic. Um, they stick to water droplets. So uh, this is the, does your mask do anything? I've got one with me right now, but does your mask do anything to stop virus transmission? And the answer is, well, they aren't just on their own. They're very small. They would go through the gaps between most fabrics. It'd be very difficult to breathe if you had a mask that was fine, poor enough to not let the virus particles through, but they're typically stuck to water droplets. And there's usually more than one and maybe some bacteria, maybe some cells and dust and things in each drop. So as it dries, if we, if I breathe out or cough some aerosol, some water droplets, spit droplets, even if it dries in the air, whoops, I'm trying to do it that way you can see it, even if it dries in the air, there's still salt and proteins and bacteria and my own cells that mean that it won't form a very, very tiny drop and it will get charged and tend to stick to things. So when outside there are, I don't know why it says germs because it is a little bit of a weird term. But anyway, there are particles per meter cube, so some but it's approximately five times less than indoors, which is again is why they tell us during this pandemic, it's not so bad if you meet people outside, it's pretty bad if you meet them inside, 
because then the particles float around it takes a long time for them to settle outside they get driven away and they get exposed to sunlight and all kinds of things and get lost so when it's uh reproduction due to drought cold and right, that's uh that's a weird negative sentence so what it's actually saying is if it's dry or cold or there's ultraviolet light it will cut down the amount of bacterial reproduction viruses can't reproduce on their own they need a cell anyway um, but it will as particles in the air as aerosol particles the bacteria and viruses are mostly not doing anything um, if there's enough water they can do things if it's dry it's very difficult for them in the higher atmosphere it gets colder and colder and then they slow down on their own so they can survive for a long period but they're not necessarily active in the atmosphere so this is some um, particles of somebody sneezing how lovely these are some colonies grown from probably sneezing on the plate you can see all kinds of different colonies uh, experience of doing this tells me that the darker ones are usually really smelly and disgusting they make horrible compounds that stink so this is um, more actual gaseous pollutants so this was particles of biology this is gases of chemistry and what we can see here typically is that uh, okay there are chimneys and things that are emitting the gases then it sort of goes around in the atmosphere it's converted into something else sunlight maybe water interacts with other chemicals in the atmosphere so it's converted there's conversion with the k but it's actually with the c and then it is typically rained so it absorbs into a raindrop and rains back down to the earth and kills these cavemen or whatever they are or not affects them in some way so what air pollutants could we have here's a list it's very large oh that was bad I'll try and get that back on where i want it it's a little bit difficult for me to see so we've got aerosol which are droplets of liquid or solids it says um so it comes usually from burning from dust from sprays from sneezing all kinds of things um, that's it's not an exhaustive list damaging to upper atmosphere okay well the droplets and particles tend to absorb pollutants and form chemical reactors that's where the conversion takes place typically that can be good it can be bad also we inhale them they go into our lungs and that can be also bad if it's down here now you look down ammonia ammonia is nh3 it's a smelly uh, yeah nitrogen compound chemical compound it says okay it comes from agriculture so it's typically here it's when the farmers put poo onto the fields and it rots piss is actually worse so if you take urine and you put it onto the fields it rots and it releases ammonia that's one of the byproducts and if it can't be absorbed by the field quickly enough it evaporates into the air and causes a problem it can make your eyes water it can give you lung problems so that's why it says respiratory health damages building material so if you go to a farm or you have kept animals before you will notice that where they pee it causes a lot of damage or you know we don't have such horrible toilets but if you go to a school um, where there's spray from the toilet to any surface it tends to cause a lot of damage because urine urea and ammonia are quite aggressive chemicals what else have we got asbestos okay well we've mostly stopped using asbestos these days it's carcinogenic so or one of them particularly is carcinogenic so it's particularly hazardous um, as particles in the air not so bad as a building material but it, but it's still a problem because you've got to do something with it later when you destroy the building 
So carbon dioxide is the um, greenhouse gas that we're worried about, not because it's particularly hazardous, but because there's a lot of it. It comes from burning stuff. Um, fossil fuels are a particularly bad case, but burning anything or compost. Uh, yeah, damaging for the climate. So what else do we have? Carbon monoxide, which is partially burnt carbon. It's only from the monoxide. It's uh, toxic, so it absorbs into our blood and stops us from absorbing our oxygen. It can cause you to die. Um, in lower concentrations, it doesn't do very much and it gets oxidized up to carbon dioxide quite quickly. So it's not that bad, but at high concentration, it's really poisonous. What else have we got? So here we are, the chlorofluorocarbons, which were the problem. They were mostly used uh, fire extinguishers and coolants. And it's a very, very effective um, ozone destroyer. It's also a hot, got a high um, uh, so greenhouse effect. But at the time, it was particularly effective at destroying the ozone layer. I think that comes up in a little bit. So what else have we got? Lead, okay, lead's metal um, was particularly emitted by the Romans, for example, in Europe or by uh, ancient civilizations. In most country, countries discovered uh, lead because it's a really useful element. You can extract it and make it into the metal comparatively easily. For, uh, you can make really useful things, containers for water with it, with relatively e relative ease, it protects your roof. Uh, it's excellent, except it's really poisonous. So where you process it, where you heat it up, um, where you're trying to extract other metals and lead is a sort of side product, then it tends to evaporate, form of dust. In the, so it evaporates, it condenses in the form of dust and it's dangerous and it will cause all kinds of things, mostly uh, cancer and nervous system problems. What else have we got? Mercury, much the same. Uh, it also escapes, comes from uh, burning waste very often. Uh, so emissions from burning things, because a small amount of mercury will evaporate from that and it's, it's a good idea to collect it because it is really toxic. And otherwise it rains down, goes into the fields and is taken up by plants. So what else have we got then? An M, methane. So methane is um, also a... Um, greenhouse gas, a particularly effective one. Um, it comes from landfills, natural gas, so coal mining, so breakdown of coal into methane, and livestock farting. I think we come on to that again. Nitrous oxides, there are several of those. Um, it comes from burning fuel, so we burn the fuel and we oxidize nitrogen up to higher states, so nitrous oxides. And they, down here, cause all kinds of problems. So they cause, uh, they inflame asthma and skin problems. So allergies, they cause, um, they're one of the major contributors to, uh, like, city-caused ill health. What else have we got here? So then we go up to uh, sulfates, I think. Particulate matter, particulate matter, okay, so tiny particles of something, um, they go into your lungs and they tend to carry other chemicals in there and cause damage. Uh, immune system, if they're small enough, they can get through, get taken in by white blood cells and they will cause all kinds of problems, possibly, potentially. What else have we got? Pesticides, that's deliberately making pesticides and they can escape from where you're trying to have them to somewhere where you don't want them and they will do all kinds of things because they're supposed to. They're supposed to be biologically active so it would be odd if they weren't. Um, and it turns out most poisons are not that specific. So we take something that is supposed to kill insects, it will kill them really well but it'll do a pretty good job on humans as well. Uh, as, as we get further and further away from us it gets easier to find a poison that's less likely to affect us so uh, things that kill plants are less toxic to us but they're still not great in high quantities 
and over a long time. So what else have we got? Propellants. Okay, that's the aerosol gas. That's uh, nitrates. Uh, actually, it's nitrous oxides or butane. So or um, hydrocarbons in uh, hairspray. I keep doing the wrong side and you can't see it. What else have we got? Radon is a radioactive gas. Uh, you may have heard of it. Some parts of the world where you have a lot of igneous rock, which is rock that's formed from inside the core of the earth. Um, the radioactive decay of elements inside there, mostly uranium and thorium, I think it is, turn into radon, which is a radioactive gas there that um, is not overly hazardous. There's not very much of it. It's not very radioactive. But if you um, have a cellar that's made out of uh, granite or you have a mine or something, so underground particularly, then it can leak into your house outside. It doesn't really build up, but it can build up a lot in underground parts of buildings. And if you breathe it in a lot, it's not great for you. It is radioactive. And you can't smell it or detect it any other way. So refrigerants, okay, that's a problem because it's got its ozone depleting and it also causes the greenhouse effect. What else have we got? Sulfur oxides. So sulfur oxides cause um, acid to form. It can burn your eyes, can burn your lungs down here and up in the higher atmosphere. It doesn't do very much. It uh, hangs around on particles, but then it rains down. Next time it rains, it dissolves in water, it comes down and it tends to acidify the lakes and kill trees. Okay, so they've started with carbon dioxide. So some uninteresting facts about it. You can't smell it, you can't burn it. It's slightly heavier than air. Mixes with air though. It's produced during combustion of carbon and breathing and respiration of all kinds of things. And there's a major cycle, obviously normal natural cycle, but we've interfered with it by burning stuff. Um, if you get an accumulation low down because it's slightly denser than air, it can uh, kill you um, and it doesn't take very much um, okay it's a lot eight to ten percent is quite a lot um, event but uh, if we hold our breath or we re breathe in an enclosed area it's not the lack of oxygen that kills us it's actually the buildup of carbon dioxide um, 5000 ppm okay it's still quite a lot so this is what's supposed to happen or what happens um, what's going on this is the greenhouse effect so light, light comes in it heats a small amount of it heats the air and that is lost back into space radiates back into space and some of it heats the ground which comes back out which reflect radiates back also back into space so oh, that's that's the land radiating back into space but if we um, have greenhouse gases up here or any gases up here actually they absorb some of the light that's coming back off the surface of the earth and keep it in our, in our environment effectively so the top of the atmosphere gets warmer and warmer and that warms up the bottom of the atmosphere so effectively that's what's called the greenhouse effect if we have a greenhouse we've got a plate of glass it allows the long wavelengths uh, sorry the short wavelengths light from the sun through but when infrared, when it hits the ground and is converted into longer wavelength light infrared and comes back out again, is blocked by the glass. And although uh, a greenhouse could be really, really thin plastic or really thin glass, it still is noticeably warmer than outside just because of that effect. And it only takes a few degrees to have a major effect. So we're talking here of a worry of half a degree, one degree maybe. So what have we got without it at all? Okay, without greenhouse effect at all, we would have, our planet would freeze completely. So we need some, and but it's balanced very, very uh, tightly, effectively. So here we've got most of the temperature increase is actually due to water. There's a little bit from carbon dioxide, 7.2 degrees, but as I say, half a degree is what we're worried about. Methane, 
0.8, although there's a lot less of it, 1.7 ppm, it's a lot more powerful. Um, nitrous oxide, again, there's a lot less of it, but it's much more powerful. Ozone is very effective. There's only three parts per billion, and it has 2.4 uh, degree centigrade increase, but it also protects us from ultraviolet, so we have to have it, otherwise we couldn't go outside, particularly us white people. So here is an example of global, uh, global carbon cycle. So this is the trees rotting, releasing carbon dioxide, absorbing carbon dioxide, about the same amount. They're absorbing slightly more than they're giving out, whoops, the trees and the rocks. Um, so when water from the rain absorbs carbon dioxide, it dissolves into the rock and makes carbonates. And so a little amount of carbon dioxide goes into the ground from the rocks breaking down. It also absorbs into the ocean, but it can't do that forever. So there's uh, water going into the ocean, uh, carbon dioxide going into the ocean, carbon dioxide coming out of the ocean, and it's pretty much the same, especially slightly more in that case coming out. If we go further in time, so they've changed the time to 2008-ish, we've got um, more carbon dioxide going into the sea than comes out, so it's getting more and more acidic. Um, it's absorbing carbon dioxide, and that was noted for a long time. It was a sort of, why isn't there an effect question? Why isn't it going up faster? Um, the rocks have stayed the same, but we've built uh, some kind of industry, and it's making lots of carbon dioxide. Um, it's small compared to the natural cycle, but it's added to it, and, it, and it's not balanced. And also if we cut some trees down, so this is cutting some trees down, it causes more composting effectively, more carbon dioxide to be formed. And so we've got a net loss in this part. So this is the increase over time. And again, as I said, it's, uh, it's slightly, um, yeah, not uh, slight, slightly off because it should be really show longer because it, it wobbles around a bit up here. But we can see that the carbon dioxide concentration goes up quite significantly at around the Industrial Revolution. So this is caused by okay, uh, greenhouse gases. Okay, they're talking about greenhouse gases in general. So this is carbon dioxide, but also methane, nitrous oxides, and chlorofluorocarbons as well, which is expected to cause all kinds of things, including extreme weather changes in regional ecosystems, so um, forests move further north, for example. Um, some deserts will get bigger, some of them will get smaller. Mostly the problem is when they get bigger, because it's hard to make them smaller. Okay, so moving swiftly to the next one, because this is not the best diagram. We've got several others like it anyway. So let's go on to the next one. Go on to carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a gas that's not, uh, it's got no smell, it's colourless, but uh, we can actually burn it. So they used to do that in parts of the world. Um, it was called water gas. So if you got uh, coal and you burnt it in water atmosphere, it would make carbon monoxide and hydrogen and water and carbon dioxide. But the carbon monoxide and hydrogen were what were interested, interesting. It was uh, sent through as town gas and um, a lot of the sort of myths about putting your head in an oven to kill yourself come from when they used to use a mix of water gas for, um, you know, for people distributing to people in their houses. It wasn't all over the world, but it was a thing for decades. Uh, so deliberately, if you, so you can deliberately make it by burning carbon in steam um, but it's accidentally produced when you if you don't burn things properly so gas and petrol car exhaust you can improve it with a catalyst as it says here is used to uh, reduce metals to their so iron for example is reduced with carbon monoxide to uh, so iron ore to iron and the carbon monoxide goes up to carbon dioxide takes the oxygen off the iron ore 
Um, the problem with it is, is that it is absorbed preferentially to oxygen. Uh, it binds better than uh, oxygen does and so you can die at low concentration or if you go away relatively quickly, so you just get a sniff and it go away, very little happens. You get a headache but nothing happens. Um, but um, if you have constant concentration it's quite unhealthy and if you get uh, that's quite a lot but if you get uh, a much of your so if you, much of your hemoglobin is sequestered is absorbed with carbon monoxide then eventually you have problems so if 20 percent is affected that causes you to have oxygen reduction uh, so you have a problem and you die if it gets too much and it takes a while for it to to recover because your body has to make new hemoglobin it's just not like it recovers on its own so uh, it's not super bad because it doesn't poison you any in any other way it doesn't give you any other things but it does stress your body and it is reasonably persistent so it lasts um, for hours so this is what it looks like it's carbon with three bonds to oxygen here is a weird thing, I've never seen this before, but there's a carbon monoxide deliberate pipe to somewhere, I'm not sure what it's for, uh, so don't ask me that. Um, this is a detector, we often have those in our labs, so it might even be one of ours, and this is some cars releasing carbon monoxide, you can't see it. What else can we have? We can have methane, that's the problem. It's a small hydrocarbon, um, it's formed by uh, composting typically, so in the water, in the sea, in, in cows, in compost heap. Um, so mostly comes, or a large amount comes from rice planting, it's the soil, so moist soil does it because it can't be oxidized fully up to carbon dioxide, so it turns into methane, and also by ruminant stomach, so that's cows farting. Much of it, in fact. Um, Okay, it can burn in the air, it can explode, but those are not so important as a pollutant because it's much lower concentrations that it's a pollutant and it's a greenhouse gas is the most important one because it's reasonably non-toxic. So here's a picture of it, it's a little pyramidal molecule, it comes mostly from natural wet areas. What's that other thing? So then from cows, or that kind of uh, set of animals, rice fields, then um, like waste deposits, so that's uh, like landfill. Uh, I'm not sure what that one says there. Then we've got uh, um, biodegradations of sewage plants, because obviously the poo in water mixture will also degrade and there isn't enough oxygen because it can't get through the water very easily so we get the same effect but it's not a natural one so it's effectively a natural wetland but in small and artificial uh, termites yeah termites because they eat wood and part of the breakdown products of wood is methane methanol methane um, oceans and fresh water okay then we get on to <coughs> sulfur dioxide which is effectively uh, sulfurous acid, sulfuric acid. So this is a sulf if it dissolves in water, it forms H2SO3, which is sulfurous acid, and that can oxidize up to sulfuric acid. Um, it's produced if you burn things that contain sulfur, which is in most organic things, because a lot of proteins contain sulfur, the thing that holds your hair together. Uh, so when you curl your hair or straighten your hair, you're forming sulfur sulfur bonds and that sulfur is released when you burn it as sulfur dioxide and becomes acid rain. So it goes up into the upper atmosphere, transported very far because it's hot in the, when you burn it, so it goes up quickly. Um, it was blamed for forest decline in particularly northern countries because the air goes up and across. Um, it can be fixed by removing the sulfur with a base or um, a scrubber, which is effectively liquid. There's water that absorbs 
the sulfuric acid and converts it into most usually into a calcium salt. You can also use coal that contains less sulfur and use um, other fuels, oil that contains less sulfur. Um, that's significantly reduced the problem. We can also remove some of the sulfur before using them, so it doesn't mean that we can't use those fuels. Uh, the marine fuel continues to be a problem because there are weird legal reasons why that is not as clean as any other ones. And there is no flue cleaning. So the moment you're offshore, it counts as a weird legal area and they generate a lot. Much of it is, yeah, ships are a big problem. So there it is, SO2. Uh, it's got some, yeah, it's got some extra electrons. Now, I'm not sure whether that's a good drawing because there are two pairs of extra electrons, but anyway. Um, there it is coming out of the ship. This is dead wood um, that recovered fairly quickly after um, flu scrubbers were introduced and the amount of sulfur in fuel was reduced. There was a, an agreement to reduce it in Europe. Asia is still affected. Um, okay, so then we can have nitrous oxides are generated. There are a lot of them, that's why it's N. OX, it can be N2O something or NO3 or NO4, there are a lot of them. So they're, they're just considered to be nitrogen oxides and they're generated at high temperature when just high temperature air, typically inside car engines or power plants or anywhere where else where you burn things. Also by bacteria, they form nitrous acid, nitric acid, nitrous acid, that cause, also causes forest decline, also causes pollution to our lungs, which I mentioned before. They react to form smog if they're down low. Um, so if we've got car exhausts and water drops and light, then it forms all kinds of things, ozone um, and nitrous oxide and ozone, and they form uh, smog, which is really bad for us. So nitrous oxide is also potent uh, greenhouse gas. So here they are, N2O, NO, N2O3, NO2, N2O4, and N2O5. Um, and they are oxidized back up in the catalytic converter. I'm trying to work out where, which way it's going. It's going this way. So this is the exhaust going this way. This is taking out particles. And then there's a catalytic converter afterwards, which is converting these back into nitrogen and oxygen, or at least mostly. This is a, an alternative, so I'm sorry it's in German, it's an alternative form of combustion that's a little bit cooler, so um, there's an, and this is normal combustion and then here they're injecting air around it or oxygen around it, I'm not entirely sure which, and that uh, dilutes the flame spreads it out over a larger area so it's not as hot and not as reactive and that uh, reduces the amount of nitrous oxides that are formed. What else have we got? Formaldehyde. So formaldehyde formed from the oxidation of methane. It's uh, uh, the preservative for dead bodies. It's, um, yeah, it's not good. It's quite poisonous. Um, it smells quite strongly. It come, it's made in uh, biology reasonably commonly, but in low quantities. And it can cause allergies, cause all kinds of bad things, carcinogenic. It's common. Um, it's released from some adhesives when they cross link uh, and they outgas over time. Um, so indoors is a, sometimes a problem. And if you burn things, it can be produced. So here's a picture, here's some particle board. Um, they're probably examples of what it can come from. Hydrocarbons, okay, there are a lot of those. A lot get lost, so it's hydrocarbons being lost to the environment. So if we have an oil spill, it evaporates into the air. If we spill some petrol, it evaporates into the air. All of that is air pollution. Uh, there are natural sources, things like algae produce hydrocarbons, some waxes that plants make are hydrocarbons, um, but it takes a long time to be degraded. 
so these are space filling models that so this is methane this is ethane not actually sure what that is looks like um phenol or something uh, uh toluene so um this is an oil spill this is probably oil drilling so what else can we do we can also put halogens that will be fluorine and chlorine iodine bromine onto our a hydrocarbon instead of hydrogen so if we take our methane which is this one and we change one of these hydrogens for a chlorine we form chloromethane that would be a uh, whoops it would be a halogenated hydrocarbon um, they are typically don't burn nearly as well because it's harder to break that bond it's already oxidized effectively chlorine is an oxidizing agent it's already oxidized so we can't burn it so it's used in coolants and propellants because of exactly that you can't accidentally have a big accident fire explosion but um, it's very they're very stable they rise into the stratosphere and they form exciting things which is chlorine radicals chlorine atoms on their own when they get hit by ultraviolet light which they can't do down here because there isn't very much but when they get up there instead of making ozone the ultraviolet light it starts to break down the ozone which is bad um, often contained in old fridges the uh, problem as i mentioned before is chlorofluorocarbons in old fridges because uh, they've been banned in most of the world uh, fairly effectively so here we are this is a uh, this is the process of making them of making that's chloroethane discovery of chloroform causing people to go unconscious uh, obviously a histo an, an historical document so the ozone hole was produced ozone is normally produced um, in the stratosphere that's where that hot spot is where the ultraviolet light is converted into heat because it breaks oxygen and the oxygen forms into ozone and the ozone combines back to form oxygen and releases heat so it keeps that area hot there's, there's a sort of composition and decomposition it's breaking it up and forming it again in the balance but if we put other things in there like the chlorofluorocarbons in there it shifts the balance and it reduces the amount of ozone which means that more ultraviolet light comes through and more ultraviolet light comes through it gives us all skin cancer instead causes damage to life so it was discovered in the late 70s and it got worse and worse um, and has uh, particularly over the poles here's a picture of the ozone hole that was I don't know whether that was the biggest it got but it was pretty big um, so this is the concentration of ozone you can see it's particularly low there is because the cold air collects and the more of the chlorofluorocarbons so here we see the decline this is the time and the production of uh, chlorofluorocarbons which are the target compounds and it went down massively from the 1990s to nearly zero in industrial countries which is the northern hemisphere plus australia and new zealand so um, in the other ones there wasn't so much it went up slightly because obviously the price went up when all these countries stopped making it immediately or it, they're not stopping immediately but they stopped ramping down production very rapidly um, obviously the price went up and so it became lucrative to make some but uh, nicely it didn't go horribly wrong other countries didn't take up the slack and the total production is very low these days you can't buy things like chloroform anymore um, not very easily it's a speciality chemical which is uh, we can't buy it very easily um, so there are only a couple of countries that didn't agree then we got asbestos as an example of a particle pollution so um, it was it's a natural silicate material and they're linked they're similar chemicals they've got a sort of fibrous structure they're very practically useful because they're very heat resistant 
um, and they can be made into mats and tiles and building materials and used to protect against heat and insulate against heat. They were used for a long time um, because they were so super useful and then they were found to cause cancer. Uh, so what happens is you breathe in the fibers and they uh, are absorbed by cells and they damage them and it carries on for years and years and then you get cancer. Uh, so um, it matters what the length is and so some of the asbestos is worse than others and it has been almost entirely banned. <coughs> so since uh, yeah, 1936? I don't know. So asbestiosis was, was recognized as a disease and you can see between 36 and the 70s was when they eventually gave up using it quite so much it's now almost impossible to get. Um, so when the UK joined the EU they pretty much stopped uh, buying asbestos. Um, America continued for a little bit longer but uh, it's now almost impossible to buy even if you wanted it. This is what it looks like, little spikes. Um, this is the typical asbestos roofing material. Yeah, it's still about because if you don't touch it it's not that bad but if you try to dispose of it some of these little fibers go into the air and if you breathe them in they cause problems. The end. So that was air pollution. We'll come on to a different type of pollution next. Then, cheerio.